Have you ever felt like you've received the short end of the stick in life? I felt like that a few times in life. And one of the one of the moments that comes to my mind when I think about uh, moments like that is when I went for a job interview. I, Michelle and I were living in London. Um, we had been we had not been married too long, a, a year or two, I think. And um, the IBEW was hiring, which the IBEW stands for the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. So it's, it was the Electricians Union, and they were hiring, I think, it was four or five positions. Um, and so I sent in my application along with uh, lots of other people looking to get that job. And, uh, and I was thankful when they called me for an interview. I got called for an interview and I showed up that morning. And when I showed up, there was uh, maybe 10 or 15 other people there to apply for the job. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this before, but when you're kind of in the waiting area for an interview and there's all the people with you, you kind of size up the competition, you know. You kind of look around the room and you're like, well, I, I, you know, I, I, I think I like my chances or I don't like my chances based on what you see. It's very a very judgmental process when you're uh, doing a job interview. But anyway, I was there for a while and it was pretty clear. I, I was nervous as I was waiting to be interviewed and it was pretty clear that uh, those other guys that were there uh, were, were feeling fairly nervous as well. But eventually my name got called and I got welcomed into the room. And in the room uh, there was a rectangular table and there was a few people around the table, most of whom did not seem like they were there for a job interview. Uh, they, they were like ripped jeans and a t-shirt kind of attire and they were clearly not paying attention. It was like they did not want to be there and it was, it was not their thing. And then there was one or two people who were actually looked like they were there to do the interview and they asked the questions. Uh, they asked me questions at the beginning, a few questions like, you know, why do you want to be an electrician? Uh, why do you think you'd be a good fit for the job? But vast, the vast majority of the questions in that interview which I think the total interview lasted uh, a little less than 10 minutes. Uh, the vast majority of the questions were about the union, what I knew about the union and, and you know, what, what I thought about the union and that sort of thing. And I, 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 would, I was not familiar with the union at all, so I did not have great answers to those questions. And when I left the interview room, I thought, well, I probably didn't get the job. And sure enough, uh, two or three weeks later, I got a, a letter in the mail from the IBEW and they had said that I, I did not get the job. Now, if the rejection letter had said you didn't get the job because you didn't know anything about the union, I would have been okay with that. That, 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 that would have been fine. But the rejection letter said something like, uh, we're sorry to inform you, but we, we just don't feel like you have enough uh, knowledge of electricity at this point to hire. So what you should do is you should go to Fanshawe College and you should take some courses and learn about electricity. And after you learn about electricity, you can apply again in the future. Now, how many questions about electricity do you think they asked me in the interview? Zero. <laughs> so how in the world did they know how much I knew about electricity? And I just felt like, man, that's not fair. I kind of felt like the whole thing was rigged from the start, like they had hard, already had who was going to get the job already figured out, and they were just going through the motions because they had to. The whole situation just didn't seem right. I think most of us have probably experienced something like that in the future or in our lives. And that's because it, it's, it's just like I tell my kids all the time, and if you have children, you've probably said this to your children, right? Life isn't fair. <laughs> well, that's true. Life isn't fair. There's a lot of unjust things that happen in the world. As Christians, we should strive to be people of justice. Now, there's no question that we fail at that from time to time. None of us are perfect. We've all made mistakes. We've all done things that aren't right, which is why we desperately need the grace of God that He offers us in Jesus Christ. If it was all up to justice, none of us would have a hope. But praise the Lord, He offers us grace. But even though we're far from perfect, as redeemed, blood-bought believers in Jesus Christ, we need to be people who are concerned 
about justice. That is to say, we need to be concerned about what is right and good for all people, not just some, but for all. Our text this morning is Exodus chapter 23. If you have your Bibles, turn there with me again. We're looking at the first nine verses, and here we find some important lessons about what it means to be people of justice. Let's look at these verses together. Here's the first thing that we learn about justice, is that justice requires a courageous commitment to truth. In order to promote what is right in God's sight, we must resist any outside or any internal influence that would lead us away from what is right. Justice requires a courageous commitment to truth. The ninth commandment, you remember the last few chapters that we've been looking at are basically everyday circumstances where the Ten Commandments are being applied so that the people of Israel would know how to apply the Ten Commandments. And it's the ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness or you shall not lie that informs these first two verses. Listen to what is said here. Do not spread false reports. Do not help a wicked man by being a malicious witness. Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you give testimony in a lawsuit, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd. The Bible calls us to seek what is right and good for people, to be people of justice. And in order to do that, we need to be truthful in what we say. Now, sometimes that's easy. Sometimes it's easy to tell the truth. And other times, it's a little bit more difficult. Sometimes the difficulty of being honest, of of telling the truth, comes from within us. It's our own sinful problems that arise that lead us away from truth. And other times, the difficulty comes from those outside. The verse begins here in verse 1 by saying, do not spread false reports. I think this is pointing us towards something that comes from within us. It's the problem of gossip. Gossip is one of the most common ways in which we fail to be people of truth. There is something in our sin nature that delights in the phrase, did you hear about so and so? Did you hear what happened to them? Did you hear what he did or what she did? There's something that we're like, yeah, I want to bend my ear to listen to that. And then even worse than that, there's something in our sin nature that takes what we've heard and wants to share it with others. I can't tell you the number of times that the truth has been twisted, if not entirely lost, by gossip. Somebody will say, did you hear about such and such? And then you find out what really happened or what the real situation is, and the two are nowhere close. That, that, that's, that part of our sin nature can make it difficult to be truthful people. We need to fight against that. But the problem isn't just from within ourselves. It also comes from outside of ourselves. There's this great problem that's described here. We know it as peer pressure. I find it amazing how many people in our day think that what is right is determined by how many people think a certain way. I watch the news on a, a couple of times a week and almost every time I watch the news when they're talking about the politics end of news, they almost always put up a poll. A poll is where they've taken a survey. They've asked people, a bunch of people a bunch of questions. They want to know what their opinion is. And then they give you the poll numbers. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but politicians tend to change what they think based on what the polls say, based on how many people believe what, as if the majority is always right simply by being a majority. But look again at what it says here. In verse 2, you want to be people of justice, we need to have this in our minds. Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong, it says. And then a little farther, it says, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd. Whenever someone says to me, and I I heard this on a semi-regular basis, whenever someone says to me, the church had better get with the times. 
The church had better get along with where society is at. I think to myself of all the times that we find people in the Bible who go against the majority, who go against the crowd for the sake of doing what is right. One of my all-time favorites of examples of this in the Bible is the story of three guys named Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You know those guys, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah? You probably know them better by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You remember King Nebuchadnezzar? He's the king of Babylon, and he thinks he's a really big deal, and he thinks that people should worship him. And so he builds this huge statue. I think it was 80 or 90 feet tall, a gold statue. And then he gets a whole bunch of musicians together, and he says, every time you hear the instruments play, you bow down and you worship the statue. And so he gathers the crowd. He gets out the people to play the instruments. The instruments play. Everybody bows down except these three guys. And you might remember what the consequence was for not bowing down to the statue was you get tossed into the fiery furnace. Well, here these three guys are, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they were actually servants in the king's court, and they actually liked them a fair bit. He brings them before himself, and he says he gives them a chance to change their mind. It's like, why didn't you guys bow down? When the instruments play, you bow down, or I'm going to throw you into the furnace. And they're like, no way, man, we're not doing it. I actually love what uh, they say to the king in response when he's trying to get them to worship the statue. Listen to what they say. O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from us, from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. I love that line. That's one of my favorite. It's like, no matter what, we're not going to worship that statue. They're going to stick with what's right. And if you know the rest of the story, you know that their faith is well-placed because God does miraculously rescue them from the flames. We need that same kind of courage to be people who are concerned about what is right and good, to be people of justice. And thankfully, God, I believe, graciously gives His people that kind of courage. It's amazing to me how often we witness someone being shamed into submission to evil today. In the day and age in which we live, it doesn't take long for a a video clip or a tweet to go uh, make its way around the world. And every now and again, I will see a tweet or a clip or a video of somebody of some kind of notoriety, maybe an actor or a... uh, a business person or an athlete, and they'll say something in support of biblical values, of biblical truth. And uh, it, it generally gets Christians excited. I, 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 I regular people will come to me and they'll say, did you hear that so-and-so is a Christian and that they stood for what's right? And I think uh, I never get too excited at that. I, I always say, well, you know, that, that's, that's good. That's, that's, I'm, I'm encouraged by that. But I always like to wait a while. Because you see, what often happens, and I'm sure you've seen this in the news uh, a few times, where somebody will say something in support of truth, in support of what's right, and then all of a sudden the onslaught comes. You get tons of people on Facebook, on Twitter. You get news organizations calling this person names. Then you get uh, maybe a, 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 an athlete's sponsors are talking about pulling their sponsorship or you, know, you get protests outside of a restaurant and there's this onslaught of the crowd. And you know what happens? Often happens after a few days or a couple of weeks of this. The person who said what is right initially, they'll apologize for it. They'll bow their will to the mob, to the crowd. When that happens, when a person goes along with the crowd just because the crowd is the majority, then true justice, what is right and good, is lost. Rumors are untrustworthy, and we should not repeat them. And the crowd is often wrong. 
True justice, what is truly right, needs to be based on the objective truth that God has revealed to us in His Word. And even if we have to stand alone against a mob, against a crowd, far better to stand with the Lord than with the crowd. Here's another important aspect of being people who stand for what is right. We need to keep in mind that justice is independent of personal feelings. When our perception of what is right and wrong bends on account of who we like or who we don't like or how we feel, we can very easily lose sight of justice. Justice is independent of personal feelings. Two kinds of people are introduced to us in verses 3 and 4. We meet the first in verse 3. It says this, and do not show favoritism to a poor man in his lawsuit. So it's a poor person that's in view here. And that's kind of a tough one because I don't know about you, but if I hear of a rich person being in a lawsuit against a poor person without even knowing the facts, without knowing anything about the case, I'm immediately rooting for the poor person. Right? It's, a, it's kind of an underdog mentality. And I think to one degree or another, we have all been affected by the Robin Hood effect. Do you know Robin Hood? Remember what Robin Hood was famous for? He's famous for stealing from the and giving to the poor, right? And he's made out to be a hero. He's made out to be the good guy. People tend to think that since rich people have so much in terms of money and possession, it's no problem for them to incur a loss. And from a dollars and cents issue, or from a dollars and cents perspective, that's actually true. But it's not true from a justice perspective, from a what is right perspective. It's right to feel empathy for the poor. It's right to care for the poor. We should care about that. But we shouldn't look the other way when a poor person does something wrong simply because they're poor. God says, don't show favoritism to a poor person in your court system. We shouldn't ignore what is right for the sake of pity. A second kind of person is mentioned in verses 4 and 5, and this really makes the point about what is right, what is just, being independent of our feelings. Listen to verses 4 and 5. If you come across your enemy's ox or donkey wandering off, be sure to take it back to him. If you see the donkey of someone who hates you fallen down under its load, do not leave it there. Be sure to help him with it. This is the positive side of the sixth commandment. The sixth commandment is you shall not murder. But God intends for us to do more than just not to murder people. He wants us to do what is right and good towards others. God asks us to care about people, even people who would be considered our enemies. And that goes against what our natural feeling is, isn't it? doesn't it? The natural response when we see uh, the ox or a donkey of someone who hates us or someone who's hurt us or who is considered to be our enemy, our natural response is to look at the situation and say, aha, serves him right. That's the way it should be. That's what he deserves or that's what she deserves. But God says here, go against that feeling and do what is right. I've learned this lesson over the last several years. I've had people curse and yell at me and speak hateful lies about me to many, many people and then call me up and ask me for something. Now, whenever I see a phone, whenever I see a phone, a phone number on my phone, I, I know it's either going to be uh, bad, I'm going to get yelled at, or they're going to ask me for a favor. They're going to ask me to do something for them. And whenever they ask me to do something, every fiber in my being wants to say, you know what, buddy? Get lost. And don't call me again. But the Holy Spirit works in my heart and says, you know what? God calls us to love and care for even people who hate us. And you got to go and you got to help them if you're able to do that. 
Now, don't misunderstand here. The Bible never says that feelings have no part in our lives. We are commanded in the Bible to rejoice. We are commanded in the Bible to weep with those who weep. We're commanded in the Bible to love other people. We're commanded in the Bible, here's a tough one, to be angry without sinning. I don't know about you, but I've been angry many times in my life. I don't know if I've ever been angry without sinning. But the Bible commands us towards that. So there's lots of things that the Bible says about feelings. They're not irrelevant. Feelings are important, but what we need to recognize is we need to recognize that feelings can be deceptive. Jeremiah points us to this in chapter 17, verse 9, where he writes, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? True justice depends on sticking with what is right regardless of how we may feel. And if we don't do that, what we end up doing is we end up excusing the poor behavior or the wrong behavior of people that we like. I really like Jason, so whenever he does something wrong, I just look the other way. You never do anything wrong, though, right? (laughs) We end up excusing the poor behavior of people that we like, and we end up being unnecessarily harsh towards people that we don't. Just imagine for a moment that a person who has hurt you, I think most of us have at least one of those people in our life, just bring that person to your mind at the moment, a person who has hurt you, and they would hurt you again if given the chance. Imagine they were on trial for a crime, and you had the evidence to set them free. Would you present it? Maybe a more everyday example. What if you were driving along somewhere and you saw that same person, person who's hurt you in the past and would hurt you in the future, given the chance, and their car's broken down on the side of the road, and you see them? Would you stop and call a tow truck for them? Would you stop and help them? As Christians, we ought to be clear about the human condition. We need to understand that our feelings can often lead us in the wrong direction. We should know our need of the renewing work of the Holy Spirit to turn our hearts, to change our feelings towards right, what's right and good. True justice will never be enjoyed in this world through human wisdom or power. It will only come through the renewing of our minds by the work of God and the rule of Christ in our hearts and minds. It is Christ who can give us courage to stand for what's right even against the multitude. It is Christ who can rightly order our feelings by His gift of sending the Holy Spirit into our lives. And it's Christ who can help us to treat people as we see in these next few verses. There's one last lesson for us here about being a just person, and it's this, that justice remains the same regardless of position or temptation. The truth is consistent whether someone is rich and powerful or someone is amongst the poorest of the poor. Whether we know someone well or whether they're a stranger, justice remains the same regardless of position or temptation. Sometimes I feel like the justice system that we are familiar with is kind of like a two-tiered system. It's one way for rich people who can hire high-priced lawyers to get them off of things that they've done wrong, and it's another way for poor people who can't afford the high-priced lawyer. But according to God's Word here in verses 6 to 9, it's not supposed to be that way. Listen to what It's written here, Do not deny justice to your poor people in their lawsuits. Have nothing to do with a false charge. And do not put an innocent or honest person to death, for I will not acquit the guilty. Do not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds those who see and twists the words of the righteous. Do not oppress an alien. You yourselves know how it feels to be aliens because you were aliens in Egypt. We saw in verse 3 that that God says, Don't Play favorites with the poor. Don't show favoritism to the poor. But then here, in this verse, in verse 6, we see that we're not to deny them justice either. 
I think for as long as legal systems have existed, there's been people who have tried to cheat the system in one way or another. And that's what God warns us against here in verse 8 when He says, do not accept a bribe. Imagine a rich person is involved in a court case against a poor person and the rich person says to the judge or to the witnesses, to the jurors, Here's all. If you side with me, I'll give you a whole bunch of money or I'll give you property or I'll give you something that you want. And the judge or the jury or the witnesses accept the bribe. What hope, what chance does the poor person have in that case if the judge or the witness is accepting the bribe? He can't do or she can't do anything And they would end up losing the case. But worse than that, justice would be lost amongst God's people. You can't have people give in to bribery or be paid off to say something that's not true because as soon as you do that, justice is lost. You see this illustrated in the biblical account of a man named Naboth. Have you heard of Naboth? Do you know who Naboth is? Naboth was a man who owned a vineyard. And King Ahab, he, King Ahab was the king of the northern kingdom in Israel. And King Ahab sees Naboth's vineyard and he says, you know what? That vineyard would make a fantastic vegetable garden. I mean, doesn't everybody need a vegetable garden? And that vineyard would just be the perfect vegetable garden. So he goes to Naboth and he says, Naboth, I want to buy your vineyard to make it into a vegetable garden. And Naboth says, I'm sorry, I, I can't sell you the property. This is the inheritance that I've received down from generation to generation. When the people of Israel first came into the promised land, God gave them certain inheritances by their tribes and by their families. And Naboth says, I'm not selling. So Ahab goes home and he's all discouraged and he's down in the dumps and he's sad that he can't buy the vineyard to turn it into a vegetable garden. And his wife, anybody remember what? Ahab's wife's name was? Jezebel. That's right. Jezebel says to him, what's the deal? Are you king of Israel or what? Stop being sad. I'll get the vineyard for you. And what she does is she says, organize a get-together. And Ahab organizes a get-together and Naboth is invited. And sitting at the table of that get-together, Jezebel had hired some, the Bible calls them scoundrels to say things that were not true of Naboth, say things that were worthy of him to be executed, to be stoned. And that's what happens. They start saying these things about Naboth, and Naboth is dragged out of the get-together, and he's stoned. He's put to death for something that wasn't true. When people forget the truth because somebody of power or influence has paid them off, justice is is lost. I've heard the phrase before, maybe you've heard it too, everyone has a price. You heard that? What people mean by that when they say that is that if you offer someone, no matter who they are, if you offer them enough money, enough of something that they want, you can get them to do whatever they want. Whatever you want them to do. Christians should have No price. God's people have been bought with the precious blood of Christ which is far more valuable than anything else that we could ever be offered. And when the preciousness of Jesus is clear in your mind and in your heart and it is the great delight to your soul, then no one can bribe you or tempt you into doing something wrong wrong. While the courtroom is what's mainly in view here, court cases, legal cases, the truth of these verses can be applied to all of life. Isn't it easy to fall into the trap of playing favorites? To show favoritism to the people you like and know and to ignore the stranger or the person that you don't particularly like? Isn't it easy to fall into the trap of playing favorites? What if someone famous and powerful was to come 
into church. Like Bill Gates. What if Bill Gates was to show up in church on a Sunday morning? And right behind Bill Gates, you had a poor beggar come in. They should be treated exactly the same. It's easy to be kind to those we know and indifferent to those we don't. But God calls us to something better as believers. He calls us to be people who treasure what is right and good, to love justice, to see that justice does not have a price, to be people who cannot be bought, to be people of integrity no matter what. I believe by God's grace, we can be people of justice. Not something that comes from us. This isn't something that we get to on our own, but it comes to us by God's grace. By God's grace, we can be people of courage. The day is coming, I think, or the day may come when we have to stand against the crowd. I think in many ways, it's, it's already here. We're not going to stand against the crowd for the sake of God's truth by our own strength. That's not going to happen. It's going to happen by the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. So we need God's grace to be people of courage. By God's grace, we can be people who do what's right, who say what's right, regardless of how we feel. We can be people who go against our emotions for the sake of what is right. By God's grace, we can treat people fairly regardless of who they are or what they can do for us. If justice is to be found anywhere, I think if we were to do a survey of most people, most people, if you ask them, do you want to live in a just world, most people would say, yes, I want a just world. If justice is to be found anywhere, in this world, brothers and sisters. It needs to be found in the church. We need to be people who care about what is right and good. Not just for some people, but justice for all. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you and praise you for your word, and we thank you and praise you for your mercies. Lord, we know that you are a God of holiness and you are a God of justice. And you love justice. You love what is right. And I thank you that you're also a God of grace and mercy. And Lord, I thank you that you did not compromise your justice in order to show your grace, but your justice and your grace were perfectly fulfilled in the cross of your dear Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh God, help us to be people who live for what is right and good. Help us to be people of justice, and help us to be people of grace, I pray in Christ's name. Amen.